Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. This is a glorious day, 1790, 2015. 225 years ago, a Methodist congregation was formed in this community. This church, this community was blessed to have Francis Asbury to come here and even preach at the arches of the old courthouse. Been a part of uh, three different annual conferences, the South Carolina Annual Conference, the North Carolina Annual Conference, and the Western North Carolina Annual Conference. So I welcome you here this morning as we come to celebrate and to say thank you, God, for how you have moved in this community and in this church. One particular announcement, at the close of the worship service, everyone is invited upstairs on the third floor for a meal. We are asking that you sit at tables until Bishop Goodpastor and I get up there. Sorry, we're not going to say the blessing first. You're going to wait for us. And once we get up there, then we will have the blessing for the meal. So when you get up there, if you gather around the different tables and just have a good time sharing with one another, we hope that you will do that. May we pray. We are blessed, God. Open our eyes and open our ears that we can see and hear the blessing that you have given us. And Lord, may we never be selfish, but may we pass that blessing on to others, those that deserve it and those that don't deserve it. For we have been called to love all people and to bless all people regardless of how they treat us we gather this morning to worship you god and to praise your name in christ's name we pray amen as we stand for the opening hymn i want to remind you that, that charles lydeker we're playing a recording that he did of this particular hymn we wish that charles was with us today in person but he is with us in spirit and when you hear what he has recorded, you will see him high and lifted up for the wonderful Christian example that he was to every one of us.
May we remain standing for the reading of the Psalter, which we will do responsively. It is Psalm number 4, hymn page 741, and we will sing the response. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You have given me the power and the strength. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, O people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love your word and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the righteous as God's own. Be angry, but do not sin. Offer right sacrifices. And put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. The New Covenant reading comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19 in your pew Bibles found on page 949. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you... But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The epistle reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, found in your pew Bibles on page 1066. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. 
What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of God for the people of God. God, we, we are in all of you, God. You, the one who created the world. You're the one whose son came to be our savior. You, the one that sent the Holy Spirit. We are in all of you this morning, God. We are in all of you because your love has come to redeem sinners and we confess that we do sin. And if we take time, Lord, as we have been instructed to be still, and as we think about ourselves and as we think about you, we will know that we have not done what you've asked us to do. We have hurt people with our words and our actions. We have hurt people by our inaction. Lord, your amazing love comes to forgive sinners. And this morning, Lord, as you show our sins to us, may we dare to have the courage to confess. And not only to confess, Confess, but repentance means to turn and go in the other direction. We will need your help there, God, for there are some things too hard for us. And to turn our lives around is rather hard, but you promised, your son promised, that, that if we're in him, we become new creations. And so this morning, God, we desire to become new creations. Lord, we, we want to be people who understand what your love is about and share it. For your love is a wonder to this world. And as a particular song goes, talking about seven wonders of the world, the words say, to hear the ripples in a lake, to see the sun when I awake, to smell the rain after it falls, to taste God's grace each time he calls, to laugh as often as I can, to feel a baby's little hand, to know the love from just one girl. I hear the music in my head, to see God's plan for me instead, smell success one step away, to taste sweet victory one fine day, I laugh just knowing I've been saved no matter how I once behaved. I feel God's love inside me swirl 
the seven wonders of the world, to hear, to see, to smell, to taste, to laugh, to feel, and to love. I hear the call and see it all. Smell success. I taste the rest. I laugh out loud. I feel so proud to share God's gifts of love, to hear your child call out your name, and see them love you without shame. To smell the breeze, to taste the salt and ocean spray, to laugh at troubles big and small, the satisfaction of it all, to love this land where we've been born, the seven wonders of the world. Lord, we confess our sins, we receive your forgiveness, and we receive the new life that you will give us, and then we will we will understand the seven wonders of the world. Would you join with me as we pray together John Wesley's covenant prayer, which is found in your bulletin. I am no longer mine, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it and the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The ushers will come forward. We'll have our morning offering. May we pray. We have heard your word, God, to give thanks in all things. And so this morning, God, while we see misery around us, while we hurt, while we are broken, may we still give thanks because you've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.
remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 48, found in your pew Bibles on page 920. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them, and Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. And then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of our Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and before the bishop comes to preach, I want to share just a little bio with you. Uh, he is married to Deborah. They have two children and four grandchildren. And I would imagine he probably has pictures in his billfold to show you if you wanted to see them. He has been a bishop of our conference for eight years in his eighth year. Uh, he served the uh, Alabama West Florida Conference as bishop for eight years. And then in 2008, hadn't quite been eight years here. He's been bishop of our conference. He has served as a pastor, a district superintendent in the Mississippi Conference. He started out with five churches. So did I. Five-point charge. He has served a new congregation and several large membership churches. He's written a book, There's Power in the Connection. And for two years, he was president of all the bishops of the United Methodist Church in the whole world. He got a Master of Divinity and Doctor of Ministry degrees from Candler School of Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. Honorary Doctor of Divinity degrees from Huntington College in Montgomery, Alabama. Birmingham Southern College in Birmingham, Alabama. And Millsap College in Jackson, Mississippi. He earned his BA degree from Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. He is your bishop of the Western North Carolina Conference. I hope you've been praying for him and the cabinet. They've been in meetings this past week working very, very hard to help make our church the best that it can possibly be. He is a friend. He is a person who loves people, and he loves God. And we welcome you, Reverend Dr. Larry Goodpastor, to our church this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. It is a great honor for me to be here with you as you celebrate 225 years. What an amazing, amazing story of this church and all of the people who have gone before you. And it is a, it's a joy for me to uh, be a part of the celebration that has been going on and that will continue uh, as you remember and honor that amazing history. Uh, Wadesboro First is if not the oldest, one of the oldest churches in our conference. 
Uh, as a bishop, I'm invited to preach a lot of homecomings and anniversaries and assorted other uh, gatherings. Uh, this is the first time in seven years I've done a 225 year. 1790. I mean, it's just astounding to me. Uh, and it is not true that some of you were here when that started. <laughs> I have that on good authority. It is uh, an amazing record. And to be a bishop and have that honor to, to do this celebration with you uh, is certainly uh, a great thing for me. And I'm appreciative of the invitation and the opportunity uh, that I have to be here. I know that, uh, that you continue to grieve uh, the loss of one who uh, for so many years and so many decades uh, helped you lift your voices in song and praise to God. And, uh, to be able to remember and to honor Charles this morning uh, in some unique ways uh, is certainly a testimony to his, his many years of faithful service here in uh, this congregation, and, and I honor him as well this morning. Transitions are uh, a part of our lives. I think back to 225 years, you've been doing some transitions. Things have happened. Did you notice that? Uh, there have been wars, there have been great economic times, there have been less than great economic times, storms have come through the area, people have come and gone, they've served faithfully, they've gone on to the church triumphant. It's, it's a part of our life together that continues to unfold. But I want to celebrate this morning that this is not a, a time to say, okay, we've had 225, let's stop. This is sort of the beginning of the next 200 years and how God is going to continue to be faithful uh, and help you in this community uh, and, and around the world. In 1790, about the time a group of people got together to start what is now First United Methodist Church in Wadesboro, Ben Franklin died. Now, for people in 1790, that was pretty significant. He had done so much to shape the beginnings of this country, transitions. And now 225 years later, we gather to celebrate. And yes, another transition. Alongside these wonderful scriptures that you've already heard this morning, scriptures which celebrate, continue to celebrate the resurrection testimonies about the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the, and the power of Jesus and the love of God that flows out of that, alongside those scriptures, I want to place the letter of Hebrews. The letter to the Hebrews is, is a fascinating letter near the back of the New Testament. It was written to third generation Christians. So these are the children of the children, maybe even the children of the children of the children who remembered when Jesus walked. And now the church was beginning to, to expand, but it was going through some difficult transitions. I suspect that the letter to the Hebrews was written by a pastor to a group of people who were going through a difficult time. Now, if they'd have had FedEx in the first century, he'd have probably sent it by FedEx. Overnight, priority, urgent. Because the letter to the Hebrews is written with this sense of importance. It was intended for a church in the midst of conflict, living in the midst of a confusing and difficult time, the external context put pressure on the believers. They were suffering from persecution. Many people believe that the letter to the Hebrews was written either right during or right after the reign of Nero and the burning and, and the killing of Christians and the continuing persecution of Christians. And so it was, a, it was a difficult time. There was pressure to conform. You can't be like Rome, you can't be. The culture was not being cooperative. And yet the church was placed in the midst of that kind of setting. So that kind of external pressure was being felt by the members. 
but there was also some internal struggles. Now remember, this is third generation. People are beginning to lose some of that initial enthusiasm and excitement for the gospel and for the good news of Jesus Christ. In the letter to the Hebrews, you read about some of the things that are going on inside the church. They were growing lazy in their practices. In fact, there's even one passage that says you've given up the habit of meeting together. In other words, you're finding things to do on Sunday morning other than come to worship. That would never happen in Wadesboro, right? Don't answer that. We let other things pull us away. There's a great line in the 12th chapter that says that some of the members had drooping hands and weak knees. That's a direct quote. In other words, they were getting tired. How much longer? And so the letter to the Hebrews is written to encourage them, to revive them, to renew them. I like to think maybe it was written on an anniversary. Maybe they were celebrating their 10th or 20th year of existence. And it was time to get renewed and refreshed and and re-empowered by God's Spirit. That's why there's an urgency to all 13 chapters in the letter to the Hebrews. And yet, the central message, the core of that message, you've already heard in the text from Acts and from 1 John and from Luke, The core of the message is about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus and the invitation to the people to let that be the center of their lives and of their church. I'm fascinated with this letter because I think we are also living in troubled times. This present age filled with confusion and chaos and uncertainty. In some parts of the world, Christians are being persecuted and killed for no reason other than believing in Jesus. And we need to remember and pray for them. In our own community here in Anson County, in in our state of North Carolina, we struggle because the culture keeps pulling us away, inviting us to be less than faithful. We're bombarded daily with messages about we need to do this or buy that or act this way. I've grown very weary myself of listening to news stories of violence and terror one tragedy after another. And so in the midst of this kind of world, in this confusing, complex, chaotic time, here we are, 225 years after the birth of this church. How shall we remain faithful? Well, I'll read just a few verses from the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Because I think these few verses at the end of the fourth chapter capture and invite us into a new future, into the next hundred years. Chapter 4, Hebrews, I want to begin reading at verse 14. The pastor writes, Since then, we have a great high priest. Now, he spent the first couple of chapters talking about the priesthood and the high priest and and the temple, and now he's saying we have this great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So he anchors his message, get this, he anchors his message in Jesus Christ. Since then, We have a great high priest 
who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every way has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Now hold on to that last phrase. So that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Now I want to lift up two phrases from that text and suggest to you that they are the key to who we are now and how we move forward as a people of God. It's a way to connect us with our history, but to forge a path into our future. Because of Jesus Christ, the author says, here it is, let us hold fast to our confession. Evidently, there were people to whom this author was writing who were giving up on the faith. Maybe they were just tired of the way things were going. Everything seemed to be going against them. Maybe they weren't getting any sense that it was important to maintain the faith. Or maybe, as I heard in too many years as a pastor in Mississippi, you're just not feeding me. Maybe they were just drifting away. Hold fast to your confession, he says. Maybe there were groups in the church vying for leadership. Maybe there were power struggles inside the church. I love some of the letters that Paul writes, especially to the church in Corinth, where, where we get the sense that the church was getting divided into little groups. I hear that some of you have a Sunday school class for Apollos and some for Peter and some for me. No, 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 no. We are united in our confession. For whatever reason, they were falling away. But the writer to the letter to the Hebrews says, I say to you this morning, hold fast, stay the course, let us hold fast to the conviction and the confession that defines us. Jesus is Lord. That's our confession. Jesus is Lord. And as we enthrone him in our lives, as we place him as the Lord of our lives, it changes how we live. Hold fast to your confession. Don't forget your confession. Because you see, when you lose your confession, you lose more than just words. You lose your identity, your uniqueness, your distinctiveness. We're the body of Christ, the church, who proclaims that Jesus is Lord. not anything or anyone else. Our lives are shaped by this amazing love that John writes about. Our lives are shaped by the power of the Christ that Peter proclaims in Acts. Jesus is Lord. You are a baptized believer, a follower of Jesus. And when the church forgets that, when the church loses its confession, it loses any power to impact a community. If a church loses its confession, it becomes a nice little membership club. Jesus is Lord. One of my least favorite phrases that I remember my father saying to me more times than I wanted to hear when I was a teenager, 
Son, remember who you are. Now, when I was a teenager, I had no idea what that meant. I just knew it wasn't good if I forgot. I remember, oh, I remember like it was yesterday, the first night I had my driver's license. I was going to get the car by myself for the first time and pick up Mary Ruth. It was my first date, and I'm on the way out the door, and Dad says, Son, remember who you... It ruined my date. <laughs> Started to hold her hand. Remember who you are. Now, I heard that more often than I wanted to hear, so I made myself a promise when I finally graduated from high school, left home, go to college. I said, if I ever, ha if I ever get married, if I ever have children, I will never say that. My daughter was 16. She was headed out the door for her first date. I said, honey, remember who you are? And I caught myself. I can't believe I just said that. A few weeks ago, we were at Lake Jinaluska celebrating Easter. My daughter, who has three children, she and her husband and the children were with us. We were having a great time. On Saturday morning up at Lake Junaluska, they have this big Easter egg hunt. And my oldest granddaughter, this was her last year. She's, she find, she's gonna age out to be in the Easter egg hunt. And we're headed down the hill to the Easter egg hunt and I heard my daughter say to my granddaughter, honey, now this is your last year. Remember who you are. This author is saying to the church, remember who you are. Hold fast to your confession. Remember, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ before you are anything else. And when you hold fast to that confession, it will impact how you relate to others. Loving God, loving neighbor, practicing hospitality, breaking down barriers, building the kingdom of God. Hold fast to your confession. Remember who you are. You are a follower of Jesus before you are anything else. Jesus is Lord. The other phrase in that text because of who Jesus is, because of what God has done for you, because Jesus is Lord, let us, here's the encouragement to the church, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. The choir just sang this wonderful Charles Wesley hymn, And Can It Be? It includes the phrase, bold I approach the eternal throne. He took it right out of Hebrews chapter 4. When fear and uncertainty surround you, when you're not sure where to turn, when grief overwhelms you, when the way ahead seems cloudy, when you are filled with doubt, approach the throne of grace with boldness. When you wake up in the morning and think, I know that I am a follower of Jesus, I know that Jesus is Lord, but I'm not sure how I'm going to make it through this day living that way, approach the throne of grace with boldness. Because it's there, the writer to the Hebrews says, it's there that you will find mercy and grace to help every day for every need in your life. Because Jesus has paved the way for us. Jesus has opened the way for us. We can live with boldness. We can live knowing that it is God's grace that will sustain us. This wonderful text from Acts that we read earlier this morning is as Peter and John and, and they heal this man and they are arrested. As you keep reading that story, they are arrested. But they are finally set free. 
because the authorities perceive in them boldness. Why, they're just uneducated fishermen. But look, look what boldness, look what courage to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, to live with Jesus as Lord. And when they are set free, they go back to the church. Church is gathered together in a prayer meeting for Peter and John, and they say, how, what, what can we do for you? How can we pray for you? And pray, Peter says in the fourth chapter, pray that we might have more boldness. Friends, that's our invitation come to God's grace to come to for God's throne with boldness God that's what I need help me and it will sustain us in these difficult times one of the responsibilities that I carry as United Methodist Bishop is to serve as our United Methodist Representative Bishop on the Council of Bishops of the Methodist Church of Cambodia. And so at least once a year I make my way to Phnom Penh to gather for an annual meeting. Not quite like our annual conference, but it's close. We have an annual meeting and there I hear stories of boldness, of people who in poverty are reaching out to others of people who are threatened by the authorities who continue to witness to the amazing power and love of God. Less than 20 years ago, the church was just getting started. If you know the history and the story of Cambodia, you know there was a period of time in the 80s, early 90s, the Khmer Rouge killed so many people. And the first people I met were 15 and 16 year old children who were the teachers of the first grade because that's all they had. And I remember meeting on one of my first trips to Cambodia. I see him now every time I go. The usher of the church, the only usher who helped greet people and welcome them in and I heard his story. His parents and his entire family had been killed. He himself, in the cover of night, walked, crawled, and hid until he could make his way to a refugee camp more than 200 miles away from where he lived. And it was in that refugee camp that a missionary, a Methodist missionary, introduced him to Jesus Christ and he returned to help serve Christ in a difficult situation and I remember asking him about his faith and the only thing he said to me was Bishop Jesus is Lord and God will see you through we celebrate that here at First Church Wings, Wadesboro. For 225 years, we've been proclaiming with our lives, with our gifts and skills and talents, with our voices, that Jesus is Lord. Hold fast to that confession. And when it feels as if you've reached the end of your rope, approach the throne of grace with boldness. And a hundred years from now, when some bishop stands in Wadesboro and celebrates 325 years, we will know Jesus is Lord. Amen.
play the organ. We just sang a hymn that was sung at Charles's funeral. And the postlude will be a recording done by Charles also. May we pray. Lord, as we go forth, may the saints that have gone before us shine bright and remind us that Jesus is Lord and we are to be bold Christians. Go with us now this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.